Now with this apostolic approach, the role of the church planter is going to be changing. And this is very important to catch because as I mentioned, the traditional pastoral church planter goes in and says, well, I'm going to gather these people and pastor them. The apostolic church planter has a very different approach. And I call this sort of the 6M roles of apostolic church planters. When I use the term missionary here, I'm not necessarily talking about an expatriate missionary. This could be a, a national person, an Indian or a Russian or a, a Chinese. But it's the person who's going in, who's sent in to plant this church. And we're thinking mainly here of pioneer kind of church planting where you're not starting with a large core of people. Well, as this church plant is started, sort of is launched, basically that church planter is what I call the motor. There's nobody else there to make things happen. If you're starting a pioneer work, you show up, you're it. There may not be any other believers there partnering with you. Maybe you have a small team that has come with you to help start that church. So initially, yes, you do have to do the initial evangelism and the initial follow-up to just sort of begin to launch the work. So yes, that missionary church planter is the motor. But as that missionary church planter is getting those ministries started, he or she is also a model. And what do I mean by that? That means that person models ministry in a way that the local people could easily reproduce, could easily also do. In other words, I want to do ministry in a way that other people could copy it and do it. Now see, sometimes a church planner comes in with all kinds of big resources. Maybe it's a PowerPoint projector or something. And the local people say, oh, well, gee, we don't have that. We could never plant a church. Or the missionary comes in, and this missionary, this church planner, this church planner studied Greek in Bible school. And so when he starts preaching, he just loves to use the Greek. And every time he's preaching, he's saying something like, well, in your English Bible or in your Russian Bible, it says this. But the Greek says, and everybody in the congregation goes, he knows Greek, right? But what else are they saying to themselves? I don't know Greek. I could never do what he's doing. That's not reproducible. So I say to missionaries who like to quote Greek, I say, well, that's fine if you want to quote Greek as long as you're willing to teach your congregation Greek so they can do it too. Most of them aren't that eager to do that. And so... We want to preach in a way. And so instead of maybe quoting Greek, maybe I know that some of the leaders in my church have a Bible dictionary, okay? So I could find a, a word that, a theological word, say like propitiation in my Bible, a, a word maybe most people don't really know what that means. And I'd say, well, in the Bible dictionary, it says, here's the definition. Now, what did I just say? The person sitting there says, I own that dictionary. I could look up that word. I could do what he did. And so we want to model ministry, and it just goes all the way through. How about the way we do evangelism? Are we doing evangelism in a way that the local people could also do that when I'm not there? Now, sometimes you're going to have big events that are sort of what we call jump-starting a movement. And we'll talk about some of those things later. But by and large, you want to have methods that are easily reproducible, like storytelling, especially if you're working among people who are illiterate or semi-literate. Everybody can tell a story and everybody likes a good story, right? And so telling Bible stories is one of the ways it's very easily reproduced. And so what we're talking about is, as I come in as that church planter, I'm thinking very carefully, I don't want to use methods that the local people could not use. I have a friend who was uh, working in Mexico and he was working in a rural area and he was traveling from village to village uh, training leaders. And he 
was riding a donkey from village to village. It was taking him, you know, days to travel around. And some, somebody said to him, you know what, you're, you're spending so much time on that donkey, I'll just buy you a four-wheel drive vehicle because the roads are not good there. And you can just drive this truck around and, and you can have these visits done in, in you know, a quarter of the time that it takes you to do this with a donkey. He said, well, that's very generous of you, but no thank you. I'm going to stay with the donkey. Why? Because if he had a four-wheel drive vehicle and he said to the local people, now I want you to do what I'm doing, they'd say, but I don't have a four-wheel drive vehicle. Buy me one and I'll do what you do. But they do have donkeys. So by him riding the donkey, yes, it was slower for him, but it was reproducible. And so you're modeling ministry in ways the local people can imitate and reproduce with the resources they have. Of course, I could go back and say, well, we want you to donate 10 more four-wheel drive vehicles. <laughs> but how realistic is that? So you want to try and find ways that are locally sustainable with what the people have and locally reproducible with what they have. So that's what we mean by modeling ministry in easily reproducible ways. So one of the keys to reproduction is, as we will see, is making ministry reproducible at all different levels. And that includes the way we do evangelism, the way we follow up and do Bible study, the way we preach, the way we do worship, and everything else. So initially the missionary starts out, or the church planner starts out as the motor, has to do most of the work, but is also acting as a model, doing ministry in ways that others could easily also do with the resources they have. And the missionary also begins to transition as the church begins to develop. So the first people have come to Christ, they're beginning to gather. You may not have even started a worship service or anything yet, but you're meeting maybe in a Bible study. The missionary as motivator, the church planter as motivator. And this means that he is instilling the sense that this is not my project. You are the church. You are God's people here. I may come and go, but you are God's people here. And so the idea of motivating them to take ownership of the ministry. In other words, I've modeled ministry for a way that you can do it. And now if this church is going to expand and really reach more people and develop more ministries and start regular church services and so on, you need to be the people who make that happen, not me. See, now what often happens is the church planner gets a little frustrated at this point. Things are maybe going a little slow. Uh, the people who sent him to plant this church are saying, hey, why aren't things happening? We want to hear good success stories. And so that church planner is getting frustrated. Things are going slow. And so there's going to be a temptation here for the church planner to say, okay, now, if you want to start services, I'll only do that if some of you are willing to take leadership. And I'll, I'll train you, say, how to lead a worship service, or I'll train some of you how to preach. And the people are going, no, no, we don't want to do that. What sometimes happens is the church planter then makes a decision. Well, we'll just start, and I'll do it. And then later, the people will come along. But you know what often happens? The people learn something. They learn if we just wait long enough, the church planter will do it. And so they sit back. And so the next time, then when somebody says, we want to have a youth ministry or something, uh, some program, and the church planner is going, well, I'll only start it if, if some of you are willing to give leadership. They go, no, we've already learned how this works. If we just wait, he'll do it for us, right? And so the whole the ministry ends up being built up around the church planter doing all these things. And of course, this looks good. The church planner can write the letters back home and say, hey, the church is moving forward. We've got services and we've got youth group and all these things. But it's built around that person. So yes, it seems to be moving more quickly. But it's all dependent on that one person. And often enough, if that person has to leave or for whatever reason, then everything stops. The people don't have that sense of ownership. And so when we say missionaries motivator, 
it's going to be very key here to instill in the even new believers that sense, you are the people of God here. God has placed you here to reach your fellow citizens in this city or in this region with the gospel. You're God's people. God's given you gifts. And even if the ministry is not as fancy and professional and polished, you will grow with that ministry. And so motivating them to have, be willing to serve, to be willing to be equipped, to say, I'm willing to make sacrifice so that the ministry moves on, that's going to be really key as that church begins to develop. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. And so when the people are showing that willingness, the church planner transitions to being more of a mentor. So now the focus is shifting from being a motor to a mentor. In other words, I'm not doing as much myself. I'm investing, I'm shifting my time from being a doer of ministry to an equipper of ministry. And so now I'm starting to spend much more time actually training people to do ministry. So instead of me preaching, I'm spending a lot of time helping others learn how to preach. Or instead of me doing counseling, I begin investing much more time in training others how to be counselors and so on. And this starts really very early along, even with just those first core believers, those new believers you're meeting as maybe a Bible study group. I start training somebody else to lead that Bible study group. And so the emphasis shifts. Isn't this what we see, at least in part, in Jesus' own ministry? The disciples basically follow Jesus for about a year and don't do much ministry themselves. They just observe Jesus in action. And of course, Jesus used methods that they could more or less imitate. And then Jesus says to them, okay, now I'm going to send out you. He sends out the 12. He sends out the 70. Sends them out and do basically to do the same thing Jesus was doing, to preach, to pray for people, to heal, cast out demons. They go out, they do this, and then they come back. And so Jesus begins to shift. He's spending more time not with the masses of people, but towards the end of his ministry, he's spending time mainly just with the 12, the upper room discourse. He's going off separately with the 12. He's spending more time with them than with the people who ultimately were to be reached. He's reproducing his ministry in the disciples. And so the missionary church planter has to have this same mentality. Yes, in the beginning, you do it, you model it, and then you begin to shift that ownership to the local people, and then you're spending a lot more time helping them develop their gifts and their ministry abilities. Now, as that church planter begins to get ready to depart, there's a transition from not only mentoring, but multiplying. And what that means is, not only am I teaching others how to do this ministry, say I'm teaching somebody how to lead a Bible study, I start helping them teach somebody else how to lead a Bible study. That's when multiplication really starts. So not only am I equipping others, I'm equipping others to equip others. And this is uh, what you really sort of hear with, with Paul says to Timothy, uh, that which you've heard from me, entrust to faithful men also who are able to teach others. So I teach you how to teach a Bible study, and now I help you teach somebody else how to teach a Bible study. I teach this person how to do personal evangelism. Now she teaches somebody else how to do evangelism. And you can just put that through the whole ministry of the church, whether it's children's work or youth work or preaching or visitation or counseling. That's where the multiplication, the empowerment really begins to, to take hold. So now the church planner has transitioned into 
that the ministries are not only owned and done by local people, but they're actually even training others to do it. And at that point, that missionary church planner can become a memory. <laughs> that person can move out and take on another ministry. That, that church planner may go to another city and start the whole process all over again, pioneering. This is what Paul more did, more or less did. Paul would, he'd plant that church in Corinth and then move on. Um, he'd plant that church and then move on and make sure there was follow-up going on, but pioneering new places. Or that person might become an equipper at a more regional level. For example, maybe this new church plant is developed to the point to where they're actually ready to start another church. Now, instead of that missionary church planner saying, I'll go and help you start that new church, he says, I will coach you to start that new church and you'll be the church planter. And again, here's where multiplication, local ownership begins to really take place. So these are sort of the changing, shifting roles that that church planner, if they're going to have this apostolic equipping approach, they're going to have to take this transition from being the doer to being the equipper to being the multiplier and then basically leaving the ministry to those people. So these are sort of the changing roles of the church planter that has chosen to take an apostolic approach. Now, if you take a pastoral approach, you basically uh, don't have to be doing all of these kinds of uh, things because you're going to be staying there longer and you're going to be doing most of the ministry. But you can see why that's probably not going to lead to real church reproduction. <laughs>